This is Dr. Joseph Zuckerman at NYU Langone Orthopedics, and you're listening to Interview with the Surgeon and the Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Joseph Zuckerman, the Walter A. L. Thompson Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at the NYU School of Medicine and Chairman of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at NYU Hospital for Joint Diseases. Dr. Zuckerman has been part of the HJD faculty since 1984 and was appointed chair of his Department of Orthopedic Surgery in 1994. Years later, he became chairman of the NYU Department of Orthopedic Surgery and initiated the merging of the two departments. He served as director of the Orthopedic Residency Program, one of the largest in the country from 1990 to 2006. He has great pride in the fact that since 1984, he has been actively involved in the education of over 250 orthopedic residents. An internationally recognized expert in shoulder surgery, hip, and knee replacement, he established the Hip Fracture Research Group and the Shoulder Research Group. Dr. Zuckerman was selected as an American British Canadian Traveling Fellow by the American Orthopedic Association. He serves as a spokesman for the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the editorial board of several medical journeys, authored 14 textbooks and over 28 scientific articles. Former president of the ASES and former chair of the Council on Education at AAOS, the largest professional orthopedic association in the world. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we have Dr. Joseph Zuckerman, Chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at NYU. Doc, how are we doing today? Just fine, thank you. Thanks for joining us. So let's just get started here. You know, what were your goals and aspirations during your residency, and how did those change during your fellowship? So when I was, uh, I was a resident at the University of Washington in Seattle, and uh, I think that when I started my residency, uh, my plan was actually to go to return to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I went to medical school, and to join an orthopedic surgeon there in practice, who was in uh, uh, private practice in downtown Milwaukee. And then when I was a resident, uh, two things, a few things happened. The first is I found that I really enjoyed the whole aspect of teaching and working with residents and students. And the second thing is that when I was a third year resident, I spent a week's vacation writing a, a paper. All right. Then I got to present that paper uh, to a visiting professor, and I decided that doing research and being able to stand up there and present results of your findings was a powerful uh, and very satisfying thing. And at that point, I decided that I wanted to pursue a, a position where I could do have an impact on teaching and training residents and also be able to perform research and enhance that aspect of what I did. So that's when I started looking for for uh, academic jobs. Now, uh, when I, I was very fortunate at the University of Washington because when I started there as a uh, first year resident, uh, Victor Frankel was the uh, chairman of the department. When I was a third year resident, he uh, moved to the Hospital for Joint Disease in New York City where he himself had trained many years before. And he recruited me to join him back there when I finished my fellowship. And he actually gave me some guidance during my fellowship is what I should focus on to better prepare me for this position. And if you ask me, is finishing my fellowship or, or first start of my position, what my goal in my career, what my goal as an academic orthopedic surgeon would have been at that time, I would have said my goal was to become the director of an orthopedic residency program. I thought that could be one of the most uh, important, powerful, and enjoyable things that I could do. And that was my goal when I first started. I wouldn't say that I, my goal was to become a chairman, but an attraction to leadership opportunities. Thinking about that from the academic standpoint, can you kind of take us through what your mentality was going through it for the first time after the fellowship? Were you set on going to NYU? Were you interviewing with other academic programs as well? Yeah, so I had, I interviewed with, and I think uh, probably four or five different programs, a few in New York. I remember I, I also interviewed at uh, Vanderbilt University in, uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, and that was because another mem member of our faculty at the University of Washington, Dan Spengler, had uh, became the chairman there. And he also uh, was interested in having me uh, interview for a position there. But ultimately, being from New York, right, I wound up uh, returning to New York, probably for more uh, family and personal reasons. And it turned out to be an outstanding opportunity. Now, why was it an outstanding opportunity? We, uh, First and foremost, because you want to be in a position that is a uh, provides you with a platform to accomplish what you think is important. For me, it was in a place with a residency program, with a department chair who wanted me to get involved in res education, 
Victor Frankl said to me, oh, I want you to make our residency program, you know, just like the one we had in Seattle, right? University of Washington, because that was, that was, uh, he thought that was a great residency program in part because of, of his, his influence. So I, I was given that direction and most importantly, the support to do that. And that's very important. You got to have a mentor. You have to be in a situation where you can accomplish what you want to accomplish. And that doesn't just apply in academic parameters. If you're in private practice and you want to, and you've done a trauma fellowship, you want to be in a situation where you can develop your, your career as a trauma surgeon to be able to do those cases. You don't, you don't want to be in a situation where you can't you know, get the, uh, the volume of cases or you're in a situation in a practice where you know, people don't recognize subspecialty training as, as providing better care. All those things have to be considered in order to, to, for you to be successful and achieve the, personal sa- the professional satisfaction that you want. So I was very fortunate. I had, that, I had a tremendous mentor who would basically support all my initiatives. But can you kind of walk us through from when you first started at NYU to the journey to how you got there to where you are now the chair of the department? Can you kind of just let, let us know what that path was like for you? Yeah. So, so just uh, so it's by way of clarification, uh, as I said, I started off at the Hospital for Joint Diseases in 1984. Uh, a few years later, we became affiliated with NYU, right? In 1994, the hospitals merged, and they merged at a time when I had just become the chairman of orthopedics at the Hospital for Joint Diseases. And the goal was to integrate the two departments of orthopedic surgery, which in 1997, I became the chairman of both departments with the goal to make it one department. So in a sense, I've been in the same place for 36 years. When I have, and what's made it so uh, enticing uh, for me and attractive for me is that over those 36 years, the jobs have changed, you know, from a faculty member to 1990 as a program director to 94 as a department chair at the Hospital for Joint Diseases. In 1907, 1997, given the directive to merge two departments of orthopedic surgery into one, right, that, that, that was a very big challenge. And, and it's, it's hard to believe it's, I've been, you know, doing this for 23 years. But even in that context, NYU has taken major steps forward to be a major academic medical center in the Northeast. Orthopedics is valued and is, and is viewed as important. And there are a lot of things that we can do to expand. NYU has developed its own hospital system, to interact across multiple different boroughs in New York City and, uh, and trying to integrate the, the, the orthopedic care we provide. So things have changed that has made it continually more exciting, right? And interesting to me and at the same time my responsibilities have changed you know for 16 years I was a residency program director and in 2006 I uh, turned it over to uh, Dr. Kenneth Eagle and made him vice chair for education and director of the residency program and I did that I had one regret and that was that I hadn't done it sooner right? because he took the residency program and made it so much better than it was that when I was a program director and that's what you want to see. You want Pete. You want to. You want to develop. Just like Victor Frankl helped me develop my career, he taught me that if the best thing you can do is surround yourself with good people, right, and give them opportunities. Because you know that saying that a high tide floats all all boats, or something like that. You know that that's what you want. And this the competition should be outward. Compete with other other departments, compete with other health systems, right? But internally, do everything you can to support and expand people's growth and development in in, in their careers. And it only it comes back to pay multiple multiples of benefits. So, what would you say were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career to help you climb the top of your industry? So, so I would say that when given an opportunity, you need to make the most of it. If somebody asks you to do something, right, do it, do it well, because that will lead to another opportunity. When it was 1986, all right, a member of the faculty here, Bill Jaffe, who was on a committee in the AOS, asked me if I wanted to be on a committee to help write exam questions for one of the uh, exams that the AOS puts out. I said, I would, all right? So I did it, worked, went to meetings and such, and that led to another opportunity, right? And then... Because if you're given these opportunities, if somebody asks you to write a chapter for a book, if somebody asks you to submit a, uh, 
a, a narrative or a review for something, all right, and you don't get it done, they're not going to ask again, right? Because there's a lot of very smart people out there who are willing to do these things. So in, since you were a sports agent, right, I continually tell people that my residents and otherwise that, that you got to be a closer. You got to be the Mariana Rivera of orthopedics, right? Come in. If there's a project that needs to be done, you need to close it out. Don't have things on your curriculum vitae that never quite got done, right? You didn't finish up. And if you're, if you have a responsibility to be somewhere, right? Uh, for a meeting, be there. Now, nobody can achieve this a hundred percent of the time, all right? Cause things always interfere because what we're talking about now is our professional existence. There's a whole personal side of this that has to be integrated into this and balanced because I'll be the first to say as much professional satisfaction as I've had for my career, it would not be near what it is if I didn't have the whole personal satisfaction, you know, my, my wife and children and my whole family life. And, and on the other hand, my personal life wouldn't be as fulfilling and meaningful if I didn't have a professional side to do. So you have to balance all those things as well. So I like to say, yes, I went to all the meetings that I had to go to and I wrote all the papers I had to go to, but I also coached my kids' little league teams, all right? Somehow we found time to do that, which means, you know, you don't, uh, you know, I never went away for a weekend to play golf with my friends, all right? <laughs> because that wouldn't have been a good idea. Now, seeing that since 1984, you have had the feat of helping educate over 250 orthopedic surgery residents, you know, what type of advice do you have for the chief residents and the fellows as they enter the job market for the first time? So uh, I think that the most important thing is to think about what you want your practice to look like in uh, five years or 10 years, right? Probably the five-year point is most important. And when I say practice, I always mean practice slash career, right? What do you want to look like at the end of that time? And then you have to carefully evaluate the position and say, will this allow you to be able to achieve that? Now, oftentimes you don't, you don't achieve 100% of it because there are always aspirational goals, but reasonable goals should be achievable in that, in that first five-year period because five year, the first five years out, particularly in academic orthopedics, help set the foundation for what you're going to achieve later on. And think about it. What, is it, is if, it, what, what type of practice do you want to have? How busy do you want to be? What's the, the, the variety of the cases you want to be? How do you expect to interact with your with your associates, right? Do you want to have mentors? Do you want to mentor people? Is teaching very important to you? So that means you want to work with residents or students. And there's all kinds of teaching. If you're in if you're in community practice, there's teaching opportunities. Nurse practitioners, PAs that you know. That oftentimes you can be involved in teaching. Sometimes medical students, right? You don't have to be in an academic center to be involved in teaching. And most people may be comfortable with that. And the other thing I would say is that you also have to decide if you're gonna, if you're gonna be involved in resident education and uh, to a, a significant degree, you have to be, expect yourself, anticipate that you're gonna be comfortable in the operating room teaching residents how to do cases, which means you know, uh, supervising, you know, uh, allowing the residents to do things under your supervision because the patient's outcome is most important, but you have to be comfortable with that. And if you're not comfortable, you know, taking residents through cases and instructing them, then you're not going to be very happy in an academic situation because residents, as all the residents know, want to be able to learn the craft of orthopedic surgery. And to do that, there's got to be hands-on, supervised, very well monitored, but still it has to be a hands-on approach. And that will help divide, decide where, where you want to go and what direction. Uh, private practice, community practice, or you know, academics. Now, listen, at NYU here, you know, we've got you know, 150 or 160 orthopedic surgeons. And I would say a third of those orthopedic surgeons are in private practice in Manhattan here. They have their own practice, but nonetheless, they, they're part of our department. They work with the residents. They come to our meetings. They participate in conferences. Some even do research. So you can't have both uh, aspects of this. But uh, ours is probably a little more atypical than most academic places. So we have both, both sides of the coin represented. Can you tell us a little bit more about your involvement with AAOS and ASES and the boards that you've served on for them? Well, so uh, as I said, you know, back in 1986, you were given an opportunity. I was given an opportunity to participate. And 
I found out, first of all, that I like doing those things, all right? I like going to meetings and participating in activities, whether it be writing questions or developing courses. And again, I combine, for me, the, the AOS can be divided into different sections. There's the education area, the research area, the advocacy area. Uh, and for me, I came in through the education side because that's always been very important to me. So it was a natural, a further, it just further enhanced my interest in education. So that committee that was writing the test was part of the education area. And a big thing for me was back in 1992, uh, uh, I got nominated to be what's called a junior member at large on the AOS Board of Directors. That was a one-year appointment, and it was, it was used to identify young people who you know, looked like they maybe they had some potential to be involved with the AOS. So uh, that, once again, that year, you go to the meetings, you, do, you, you fulfill the responsibilities that you're given, you, know, you, you uh, make sure that you, you're a closer on the things you have to do, and you conduct yourself in, in a way that recognizes that you're just the junior person on the totem pole. And that led to another opportunity, right? Which led to another opportunity. I spent, I spent six years as the uh, chair of the Council on Education for the AOS. And for those six years, I went to every board meeting. And that was probably the reason why I got nominated to be the AOS president, right? Because of all the work that I had done there. So it's, uh, it's again, it's one thing builds on another. It's a little bit like, you know, you know, succeeding in single A ball and going to double A and triple A, right? And working your way up to the, to the major leagues. And then you have to, well, at each, at each level, you're not going to progress unless you do what you're supposed to do. And the same thing with, with the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeon, which is a smaller organization, but given the opportunity to be involved in things, you do what you need to do. You fulfill the responsibilities. Keep in mind, these are all volunteer organizations. Nobody gets paid for this, all right? It's your free time that you have to put into it. And some people don't want to do that. Some people don't like it. For me, I like it. You know, it's interesting. When I, when I talk to uh, people around the country that I've, that I've, you know, have come to me for advice and things, right? When somebody says to me, they want to be a division chief or a department chair, and I say, well, that's great. But then when they say to me, you know, I really don't like going to meetings, all right? Well, <laughs> you can't, you know, you, you can't do that. Right. Not only that, you have, not only do you have to go to meetings, you got to run the meetings. You have to make sure they're productive and things. So, cause you can't, you can, you have to learn how to delegate things, but you can't delegate everything. Right. Because ultimately, you know, the buck stops with you. If you're the person in charge, whether it be for a division or a department or otherwise. So uh, again, you have to understand what you like, what, what gives you satisfaction. And for me, it's been a combination of all three things of clinical care as I have, you know, even today, you know, the, my, my practice is about 300 to 350, you know, uh, operative cases a year. So the clinical piece is important. The education piece is very important. And the administrative piece of being able to run a department is important. If I had to do one a hundred percent of the time, I would not be happy. It's the combination that makes it work for me. And can you kind of tell us a little bit about now that, you know, annual conferences are all being done virtually now, whether it's on Zoom or Google Meetups, whatever it is. And right now, those chief residents and fellows don't have the opportunity to rub shoulders with folks like yourself. What advice do you have for them on how they can still connect and reach out um, as they're going through the job search process? Yeah. So, so I would say that, uh, so first of all, this is temporary, right? I would like to think, right? This is going to be a, a difficult year, uh, but it's going to pass one way or the other. They're out there looking for positions, right? Well, for instance, in our discussion prior to your recording, you were telling me about some of the chief residents or fellows now that had, you know, it was difficult to find positions in a timely manner because of COVID. Our current shoulder and elbow fellow, who is terrific, will be a, is going to be an excellent shoulder and elbow specialist, you know, he just secured his position a month ago, which was virtually unheard of, right? Because he was, he didn't get it secured, you know, before February. Uh, so then everything was on hold for three Three months, not not just because of travel, but because of the economics, uh, economic impact of the uh, of the pandemic. Uh, so he has he has his position now. Going forward, right, people are going to be at a disadvantage, but departments still need to hire, practices still need to hire. Because what's also happened is, I think some people that were nearing retirement in practice decided that's probably you know something. This is a good jumping off point. 
there will be positions open. And sometimes you just need to get out there and you know, start emailing people, put your name out there and work through people that you know. In your residency program, you have mentors, people that know you and know you well that can recommend you to different people. And then you always have to integrate the geography into this. Right? If you train in St. Louis, uh, Missouri, and you want to practice in St. Louis, Missouri, that's easier than if you train in St. Louis and you want to, and you want to go into practice in New York, right? But then the people in St. Louis who know you well need to make the connection with people elsewhere, right, that maybe it can guide you in that direction. So I, I think it's doable, but I think uh, residents and fellows should start earlier now than they had to previously. You know, and what do you see are the biggest mistakes that young surgeons make after all the orthopedic residents that you've helped educate over the years? What have they come back to you and said, you know, I should have done this differently, or I didn't do this, or I didn't listen to you on that? Well, can you elaborate on that a little bit? The most significant change that I would suggest is that people need to look at the sum total. Sometimes I see residents focusing too much on the, the financial side of it, which is important. There's no doubt about it. It is important. But there's no point in making an extra $100,000 a year in a position that doesn't allow you to do that you want to do. That will get old fast. So you want to make sure it's the combination of things. It's the, it's the financial uh, remuneration that you get, the salary, and the opportunities for incentives, right? If the more you work, the more you, get, the more you can earn in combination with the nature of the practice and the people you work with, right? Nobody wants to work in an environment that's not friendly and conducive. Orthopedic surgery has a reputation for, for, being, for people getting along and enjoying what they do. Every, every year, medical students tell us, when we ask, why do you want to go into orthopedics? He said, well, when I, when I rotate in orthopedics, everybody seemed to be having a good time. Now, everything is not you know, happy all the time, but you're right. We enjoy what we do. You want to be around people who enjoy what you, what, what you do. And that's, that's equally important. And frankly, you know, if you're, if you're part of a partnership, and what I mean, if you're married, right, you have a, a spouse, a significant other, their needs the need to be factored into this, right? So and this is a little bit like buying a house. You know, what's the most important thing about buying a house? Location, location, location. So you need to pick a job that fulfills the location requirements, not just for you, right, but for everybody else in, the, in, your, uh, in your family unit. That's important. If you've seen one faculty practice plan, for an academic job, then you've seen one faculty practice plan. If you've seen one uh, employment agreement for a, a practice in, in the community, you've seen one employment agreement. There are no absolutes. There are no consistency. Everyone is different. So you need to understand it and recognize what works and what doesn't work because you really can't compare uh, one versus the other all that well, right? It's really something most, most often like apples and oranges. So you need to really understand what's necessary and what's needed and make sure that whatever agreement that you're going to pursue or, or sign fulfills those needs that you've identified. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.